Welcome everyone to the Heidelberg Engineering Academy. Thank you for joining our course, Monitoring Structure Function Changes with the Spectralis and Heidelberg Edge Perimeter, presented by Sanjay Azrani. My name is Eva Kroniker, and I'll be your moderator today. Just a few details before we begin. As you'll notice, all of your phone lines are muted, and this just helps prevent any feedback on the line during the course. However, since this is an interactive forum, please feel free to ask questions at any time. And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to present Dr. Sanjay Azrani. Thank you, Eva. Uh, welcome, everyone. I uh, will be talking about making the connection, OCT paired with visual fields. First, I'd like to begin with laying the background in front of you that is what we are currently doing with OCT and how we are trying to correlate it with visual fields. Next I will share with you our strategies of comparing the OCT results with that of regular visual fields and that of a edge perimeter which I'll introduce to you shortly. Following that I will share some pitfalls and artifacts as well as some glaucoma masqueraders that are important to keep in mind when one interprets results. So let's begin. Making the connection is something that we all need to do because we get sometimes false positives and false negatives both with the OCT as well as with the visual fields. But this connection which was made by Paolo and his dog is representative of how the connection is made. Watch what I can make Paolo do. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. The visual field relatively undersamples the macula. There are about 230 ganglion cells in the paracentral region overlying a size 3 target compared to only 10 ganglion cells in the periphery. Based on the work of Garvey Heat, one needs to lose 70% of one's ganglion cells in the central area of the visual field to create a 3 decibel loss compared to only 44% in the periphery. Now traditionally with all OCT machines, we have been measuring the retinal nerve fiber layer. And the area we have commonly measured it is in the peripapillary region. So here is a measurement being taken 360 degrees with 768 points. And it is laid out in front of us. Small areas of abnormality like this, as shown by the cursor, will not be represented in the average thickness of the quadrant, especially if they are focal losses. But we need to see if these losses correspond to visual fields. And we need to also see if these are because of an artifact or is it a real loss? The topographic correlation between the optic nerve and the visual field is given by this picture. You have the various quadrants of the optic nerve, superotemporal, inferotemporal, that correspond to the areas of the visual field that are affected correspondingly. So if you see a notch in the optic nerve or a nerve fiber layer defect in the inferotemporal region, you know that in the visual field you're going to look for in this superior arcuate region. And similarly, if there is an area of abnormality, say, in the inferonasal region here, you'll get a superotemporal defect. This is something that we typically do when we look at patients in the clinic. 
we also try to examine the nerve fiber layer. For example, this patient whose optic cup is not that worrisome, but if one takes a look at the area around the optic nerve, one sees that this nerve fiber layer is riddled with multiple nerve fiber layer defects. And if you look at a broader picture, one sees that these nerve fiber layer defects now become pretty obvious. So having a measurement from another area, such as the macula, might give us an additional correlate to the peripapillary nerve fiber layer measurement. We took advantage of symmetry in nature and found that macular thickness maps of the two eyes of an individual are very symmetric. And since glaucoma is an asymmetric disease typically in the early to moderate stage, any asymmetry between two eyes becomes readily apparent such as right here. So this is now displayed as an asymmetry grayscale plot of a difference in thickness from 0 to minus 30 microns between the two eyes, as shown here. For each small 3 by 3 degree area, the mean thickness is compared to the value in the corresponding other eye. So for example, in this case, this area of abnormality is depicted as the asymmetry between the two eyes with these black squares with a gray scale going from 0 to minus 30. This is right to left eye asymmetry, and this is left to right eye asymmetry. We did, however, recognize that sometimes a patient can be one-eyed and that it is important to see the asymmetry between the two hemispheres also. So we looked at the asymmetry between the upper half and the lower half of the macula and used the fovea to disc axis as the horizontal symmetry line. I'll share with you some case examples. Here is a near normal visual field in the right eye of this individual, but a extensively cut left eye with a corresponding superior hemispheric visual field loss in the left eye. This patient was being aggressively treated for glaucoma in the left eye based on this appearance, but was being treated, but not that aggressively in the right eye, until we obtained the macular thickness maps. And we found that the left eye had significant losses, as expected, in the lower part of the macular thickness, as well as the papillal macular bundle. But the right eye also had lost part of the ganglion cells that surround the fovea right here, as well as the inferior portion, resulting in a significant loss inferiorly. Mind you, this paracentral loss right here allowed us to investigate this patient further and found out that she had a vitamin B12 deficiency as well. Here is an example of a glaucoma suspect with a completely normal visual field. On first glance, it is not easy to make out that there is an abnormality here. But the asymmetry plot tells us that there is an abnormality in the superior arcuate region and in the hemispheric asymmetry as well. Typically, I look for three conjugate, that is, confluent three boxes that are in an arc-shaped area. It doesn't have to be black, but sometimes dark gray and black can make an arc. And typically, it is pattern recognition that helps us diagnose early losses. And this patient, if you look at the clinical picture, 
one can see that there is a nerve fiber layer bundle loss right here superotemporally that does correspond to a focal nerve fiber layer loss on the nerve fiber layer defect, which is actually clearly seen on the SLO image right here, as well as on the three-dimensional reconstruction of the retinal thickness map. You can see this groove here into which all the blood vessels are dipping in and coming out. This third example is that of a patient in the right eye who has a large nasal step and a small paracentral field defect in the left eye. The optic nerves actually don't give a significant clue as to which eye is worse. But as I mentioned initially, it is loss of the paracentral field areas that are corresponding to a greater extent of ganglion cell loss. So contrary to what we would have expected, the left eye of this patient has a greater macular thickness loss compared to the right eye. Note the RNFL maps that show that the right eye also has significant losses as well as the left eye and the SLO image one can make out the nerve fiber bundle defect right here, this groove that corresponds to this groove on the macular thickness. This groove right here as well is seen very clearly on the SLO image. This paper of ours, which is in press right now in the Journal of Glaucoma, shows the correlation between the difference in macular thickness to difference in nerve fiber layer thickness between superior and inferior hemifield. And as you can see, there is a very good correlation. That is, the nerve fiber layer thickness differences typically correspond with the macular thickness differences. Let's look at the Heidelberg edge perimeter. This, this perimeter uses, besides the regular white on white testing, something else called a flicker-defined form. This is an example of a flicker-defined form. This is what the patient sees. This can be done in ambient room illumination. This is an instrument that can be wheeled into the patient's room. It targets the magnocellular pathway, and this responds to movement and contrast is something that is called flicker-defined form. For glaucoma suspects and very early glaucoma is what I use it in. It is different from the FDT stimulus strategy. I'll share with you some examples. Here is case one. A FDT that is completely normal, a visual field that's normal, a nerve fiber layer measurement that shows me a focal defect right here, right here, in the right eye. It is flagged as borderline because the average came out to be in the borderline range. One can see where the right eye deviates from what the left eye typically is. If you look at the macular thickness corresponding to this focal defect in ferrotemporally, you can see this focal defect here depicted in the asymmetry analysis as a dark gray and black groove. But what you see in the FDT, sorry, the FDF, the FDF 24-2 map is the abnormality in this peronasal quadrant. This corresponds exactly with that of the loss in ferrotemporally. Note the left eye is almost normal. So this very early loss of visual field on FDF is corresponding to the loss in ferrotemporally in the macular thickness as well as in the nerve fiber layer thickness. 
Here is another case. Visual field completely normal. Now further layer, not very different, slight decrease thickness in the left eye, which is the gray line. But both overall within normal limits. But the surprise is when you see the macular thickness and you realize that the left eye, though it appears normal, is significantly thinner than the right eye. So there is an arc-like loss in both hemispheres of the left eye. We did an FDF in this patient and found that the right eye is normal, but the left eye has both superior and inferior abnormalities that are being picked up in this patient. Mind you, the superior abnormality is greater, just like it was depicted on the macular thickness. Here's a third case. This is to show you progression as well. This is March 2010 when the first measurement was taken. There was a slight hint of abnormality right there and here but still within normal limits. September 2011, this was the area, the pink area that shows thinning. You can see this bundle here that has developed a notch. Jan July 2012, this got worse. You can see the notch getting worse. And you can see this area dipping into the abnormal, abnormal red region progressively. Am I sure that this is real progression? With the help of the macular thickness, maps, yes. This confirms for me that indeed this patient has progressed. This is the macular thickness map on top from which is subtracted the macular thickness map most recently done and the difference is shown here as a red groove. The red is thinning, green would be thickening. So red arc-like thinning indicates that this patient has progressive thinning in this region in an arcuate shape, corresponding exactly to this inferotemporal loss. Visual field that is FTT completely normal. But on the FDF, you can see this patient has nasal steps, both superior and inferior, corresponding to this and this region. Here is case four. Previous macular thickness, subsequent macular thickness, subtraction. You can see this blue groove here that actually gets wider. You can see the arcuate shaped red area that shows you the difference between the two visits. Here is the nerve fiber layer showing the thinning. You can see right here becoming a little bit deeper into the region, a little blunting of the inferior region as well. So you can see this quadrant thickness dropping from 112 to 105. Here is the FDF. Right eye completely normal, left eye nasal steps right here. This patient, in fact, needed reassurance from getting an abnormal visual field test before this patient could believe the test results of the OCT, despite me showing progression both on nerve fiber layer and macular thickness. It is only then when I showed this patient the FDF was this patient willing to start treatment. Mind you, a lot of these patients are quite young and we are able to pick up glaucoma at a very early stage. So when we get a correlation between all three tests, the FDF, the RNFL and the macula, we are able to then say with some sort of confidence that indeed this is glaucoma, indeed this is progressive glaucoma, 
can be master treatment. Let's look at some glaucoma masqueraders. Here is an example of a patient who was referred to me as a glaucoma suspect. This optic nerve does show some cupping in both eyes, left eye greater than right eye. The patient's fiber layer shows significant thinning, but uniquely thinning in the temporal quadrants and not superior or inferior. The macular thickness shows significant decreased ganglion cell thickness here in this region, but relatively preserved nerve fiber bundles superior and inferior. This patient then on subsequent questioning gave a history of having had multiple sclerosis and previously undiagnosed optic neuritis. So this was an example of optic neuritis, which is what we have published previously. That is, if you get nasal and temporal losses in what seems like a glaucoma suspect, typically that patient needs to be worked up for a neurological cause of loss rather than a glaucomatous cause. It is only at the end stage in glaucoma do you get nasal and temporal loss of tissue. Here is an example of another glaucoma suspect, an inferior arcuate scotoma, a superior, but once again, as I mentioned, an unusual nasal loss. There is a loss right here of nerve fiber layer. But there was something here that we were not confident of what it was until we took a optic nerve scan. As you can see, we could have easily labeled this as glaucoma, where there was a inferior arcuate scotoma, a superior macular thickness abnormality right here, a superior nerve fiber layer loss. But when we did the scans through the optic nerve, we were able to pick up an optic nerve head bruising that was buried there. And you can see the shadow effect of that bruising right here. This is the homogeneous shadow caused by a optic nerve head bruising. This was a pretty unique example. This patient gained a block of a suspect with a temporal loss in the right eye and superior and temporal loss in the left eye. Correspondingly, the macular thickness also showed superior loss of ganglion cells, superior loss of macular thickness, and there was a corresponding asymmetry between the two eyes and between the hemispheres. The area of loss did correspond to the inferior arcuate shaped scotoma that was being depicted in the left visual field. But typically, you don't get a loss that is concentrated in this region in glaucoma and has wiped out one half of the macular thickness, which is quite atypical of glaucoma. This asymmetric difference between the two eyes is not classically arcuate shaped. Additionally, the loss temporally of the nerve fiber layer made us suspicious that there could be some other etiology. We investigated this patient with the FDA test and found that he was positive for neurosyphilis, which was then subsequently treated. An example of a patient who has an inferior hemispheric loss, a superior nerve fiber layer loss, and a very even loss the macular thickness in the superior hemisphere along with the ganglion cell loss. But again, the clues that this is not glaucoma is that the arcuate shape is not existing in the asymmetry. The other clue is that you don't get this 
even wipe out in glaucoma. That one hemisphere is totally affected and the other hemisphere is almost not at all affected. Similarly, in the nerve fiber layer, you don't get very low nerve fiber layer in one quadrant and almost normal or supernormal nerve fiber layer in the other quadrant. This was an example of non arteritic ischemic arteritis resulting in the loss right here masquerading as glaucoma. Let's look at some pitfalls and artifacts. Here's an example of a patient who had a total cup, a almost completely extinguished nerve fiber layer in July of 2010. And what we see in March of 2012, he seemed to have magically regenerated his nerve fiber layer. You can see the green areas telling us that this has actually improved in thickness, increased in thickness. You can see how the measurements have now all crept into the green range compared to the red range. The cause of this is typically uveitis, swelling of the nerve fiber layer caused by active inflammation. And you can only imagine the exact opposite of this. That is, if somebody has active inflammation, and then the inflammation reduces, the swelling of the nerve fiber layer might make one think that this patient has a healthy reserve of the nerve fiber tissue, leading us erroneously not to treat this patient aggressively. It's only on subsequent control of the uveitis do we realize that the nerve fiber layer has actually thinned out. Here is an example of a patient who showed extensive thinning from one visit to the next of the macular thickness. But again, since there is no arcuate shape in the thinning, and this looks like a bit super normal thickening, we found out that this was just a case of resolution of diabetic retinal swelling. There was no frank diabetic edema. This was some improvement in blood sugar control resulting in a normal appearing macula compared to a thicker than normal appearing macula. Here is a patient who has this one notch superiorly in July of 2012, comes back October of 2012 when there is sudden improvement in the nerve fiber layer thickness right here. This is a focal improvement. You can see this area in the abnormal region suddenly becoming improved. This area remains abnormal. The reason for this is not uveitis, but actually a disc hemorrhage. There was a disc hemorrhage here that resulted in a thicker than normal appearing nerve fiber layer. You can see the area of the nerve fiber layer defect right here. And you can see how there is a hemorrhage right there. Here's an example of an epiretinal membrane that causes supernormal nerve fiber layer thickness. As the epiretinal membrane resolves, appears to show that there has been some progression in thinning of the nerve fiber layer when all that has happened is that the epiretinal membrane has peeled off the retina. This is one artifact that is a very important one to detect. The nerve fiber layer measurement is being done in the prepapillary region. This is the exact same region from where the vitreous separates from the retina. And one can see here the vitreous is adherent to the particular region. We all know the presence of a Weiss's. Let's go of the traction it was causing on the nerve but if 
you notice the vitreous interface, it has separated from the retina. So it is important before one utilizes the nerve fiber layer thickness or these measurements or these averages to see the detail of the vitreous interface. So in conclusion, utilization of both nerve fiber layer and macular thickness with asymmetry analysis is useful when correlating with visual fields. The Heidelberg edge perimeter, FDF, is useful in detecting earliest of visual field losses. Artifact recognition is a prerequisite for any device related interpretation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Asrani, for that excellent presentation. You're welcome. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to click your question or chat button. You can send a private chat message, or you can send it to all attendees. And we'll go ahead and get started with the first question. I have a busy clinical practice and would like to maintain efficiency. I always perform the RNFL circle scan. Do you recommend using the posterior pole analysis on all patients or just glaucoma suspects? Um, the posterior pole measurement is something that is very useful when one is having a patient come back for a follow-up. So having a baseline macular thickness is invaluable. So it, it takes only an extra two minutes which I know is very valuable in a very busy clinic, but it is indispensable to be able to know for certain whether somebody has progressed or not, because then you have two parameters to look at, both the nerve fiber layer and the macular thickness, and you can say with certainty that somebody has progressed or vice versa, they're not progressing. So I do get macular thickness maps in anybody who I have one, diagnosed with glaucoma. I don't get it in all glaucoma suspects. I get just the nerve fiber layer measurement in glaucoma suspects. If there is an abnormality on that, then I will go ahead and obtain a macular thickness map. Excellent. Thank you. And another question. Why does the segmentation layers of the posterior pole analysis not include other layers, such as the ganglion cell layer? So the posterior pole analysis right now is that of the entire retinal thickness. It is from the internal limiting membrane to the retinal pigment epithelium. So it is including the entire retina. It, we have not yet reached the segmentation where we can, we can segment out the ganglion cell complex. And that hopefully should be something that may be coming in the next few months or years. This is a segmentation of the data that can be retroactively applied to all existing data. So currently, I'm happy with getting just the total macular thickness map because it is very useful in all cases except those with diabetic macular edema. So except for that and maybe some active macular degeneration where the retinal thickness is distorted and thickened in some areas and thinned in some areas where segmentation and ganglion cell thickness maps would be useful. In all other cases, I am able to manage with the macular thickness map now for the last four years. So hopefully the segmentation programs will be coming. Excellent. Thank you again for that question. Mm -hmm. Another one, how does myopia affect the MTS? Can I have you repeat that, please? How does? How does, how does myopia affect the MTS? Uh, how, um, MTS is, I guess, macular thickness symmetry. I believe so, yes. Uh, yeah, they, the, they abbreviated. It, yes, the um, myopia is um, 
something that causes great difficulty in diagnosis of glaucoma, especially when one is looking at the nerve fiber layer thickness. And that is because of the various reasons like schesis in the nerve fiber layer, posterior staphylomas in the region of the optic nerve, or peripapillary atrophy or tilted optic nerves. But macular thickness. Go ahead. Uh, am I still? Yeah. Uh, the macular thickness is very useful. And recently, a paper has come out that for the measurement of macular thickness and symmetry is a very useful measurement for monitoring and uh, monitoring glaucoma in such patients. So uh, if somebody is interested, I can always send you that uh, uh, indication uh, that was uh, recently published uh, about a year ago on how the macular thickness is much more useful than nerve fiber layer thickness in myopia. Excellent. All right. Can you have an abnormal macular thickness scan and a normal circular scan? Um, that sometimes can be called green disease, where the focal nerve fiber layer loss is averaged out in the quadrant, like I showed you in the first case that I presented where a focal loss gets averaged in the thickness of the quadrant. And therefore, the circle scan appears to be completely normal, but there is a focal abnormality in the macular thickness that is pretty obvious. So that is one case where you can get a what looks like a normal nerve fiber layer and an abnormal macular thickness scan. The other times you can see something like that could be a case of optic neuritis where the ganglion cells have been affected, but the nerve fiber layer thickness appears normal or thicker than normal either because of gliosis or because of its existence um, in all quadrants except the temporal quadrant. So there are some cases in which macular thicknesses can be abnormal, but nerve fiber layer appears to be normal. That is great. One must, I just, I'll just complete the thought here. But typically, one must remember that the macular thickness is the cell body of the ganglion cells. And the extensions of the cell bodies are the axons which go through the nerve fiber layer and into the optic nerve. So changes typically should correlate. Very good. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions at this time. But if anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact us at any time. And it looks like we have one more coming in. We have a multiple sclerosis clinic. And I understand the correlation with the HEP and spectral domain OCT. Can you expound on the power of the HEP regarding the correlation with the SDOCT? So the, I am not familiar with and the. And it looks like to ela further elaborate on the question, we always obtain GCI-IPL maps. OK. So the GCI is the ganglion cell complex, I think. Um, and uh, in the plexiform layer uh, maps uh, as provided by some machines that have segmentation software. And that is something that uh, can be useful if it is a robust segmentation. That is, if you believe the segmentation uh, is correct, then that can be useful in patients with multiple sclerosis because um, the um, Patients with multiple sclerosis, you can detect changes in nerve fiber layer and um, the uh, ganglion cell thickness. Uh, but that uh, that depiction can also be noted in the macular thickness map. That is the total macular thickness map. So one doesn't necessarily have to get um, a, a ganglion cell thickness map. Uh, 
a surrogate of that is present in the macular thickness. Now, regarding the HEP in multiple sclerosis, I unfortunately do not have experience with that. I have used the FDF mode of the HEP primarily for patients with early glaucoma and glaucoma suspects, and the white on white, that is SAP, standard automated parametry for the uh, uh, patients with established glaucoma. So I do not have experience with the, the HEP in multiple sclerosis. Thank you, and thank you for those excellent questions. Again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact us anytime here at Heidelberg Engineering. And with that, we will go ahead and conclude this evening's course. Thank you again, Dr. Ezrani, for that fabulous presentation. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all for listening. Good night now. And Good night. Thank you. On behalf of all of us here at Heidelberg Engineering, I'm Eva Kroniker. For those of you on the East Coast and in the Midwest, have a wonderful evening. And for those of you here on the West Coast, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And to all of you, thank you again for joining the Heidelberg Engineering Academy.